All right, looks like it's 6.30. Uh, thanks to everybody for coming early. I appreciate it. We didn't know until two weeks ago this room wouldn't hold 50. I guess no one looked in it. Um, so, um, so for this semester, I'm not gonna hand anything out uh, just to cut down on any sort of transfer. So I already emailed you all the syllabus yesterday, um, but let's see, there we go. Uh, but everything's going to be up on the website like normal, but the problem is they broke the websites a couple weeks ago, so you can't get to them by Google anymore. So I made, emailed you all the links for that, but if you go to cutwith2ts.ly forward slash silviculture site, that'll get you to it. And so it's all still up, it's just you can't find it from Google anymore. And so you've got the uh, silviculture textbook. Or sorry, not Civil Culture Textbook. It, it is up here with all the online readings. So if you see the readings and it says OT Online Textbook, that's up on the website. You can find it there. But there's the syllabus for you. There's the course schedule with all the readings, and all the readings are linked. Um, and then uh, for the readings, some of them are password protected. Uh, so go ahead and write down Axum Jacks, A X E E M J A C K S. So Axum Jacks is the password for any PDF that says it needs a password for you on the website. So that's how you can get in there. Um, you've got a bonus opportunity list up here. And so there are bonus opportunities available throughout the course all semester. Um, the course is set up so half the grade is uh, lecture, half the grade is lab. And so how the bonus work, each bonus points that you earn goes to the lecture average. And so a bonus point is worth 0.2 points on a quiz. The quizzes are 10 point quizzes. So if you end up earning 50 bonus points, that makes up for a quiz you've got a zero on, converts it to a 10 out of 10 basically. Uh, so that's how the bonus points work. So you can go look at that and take advantage of those. Um, I've got a terms list up. I still need to update this um, because the website's been down um, and you know, who knows what the course modality is gonna be in any given week. I haven't updated that yet. The terms are all there. The terms are going to stay the same. All I need to update on that is the week number that you're responsible for learning them for. Um, and then when I update that also, there's a quiz um, on here as well. Kind of works like the Dendro image quiz. No pictures, just sort of definition flashcards that can help you with those terms. For the quantitative problems that we're doing all semester, there are practice problems up here as well. Uh, and when you open that, it's about four pages. It's all the different practice problems. So you can print that out. You can do the practice problems. And then on that same page, if you scroll way further down the page, I put it way down so you don't accidentally see it. Uh, there's an answer key I worked up for you where you can see each of those problems worked out for you there. And so these first documents, the, the terms list and those practice problems, those are set up to help you do well on the quizzes. Um, so how the quizzes will work, um, as long as we're still face-to-face, -face, we'll come in, often they'll be at the beginning of class, and it's just one page, and on that one page, uh, it's two terms, so I give you the term, and you write down the term, and you write down the definition for the term. Um, on those terms, they don't have to be verbatim, I just need you to get the major parts of the definition so it doesn't have to be word for word, except for the definition of silviculture that we'll be going over today. So that one does need to be verbatim. Um, after that, there's a question on the reading for the day. And so for example, let me pull up the syllabus here, or actually here, I'll pull up the course schedule and readings. So let's see, if we look at this line here and that says what, August uh, 27th, so that's this Thursday. So this is the reading that would be fair game for any quiz questions if there's a quiz on Thursday, okay? So it's whatever reading is listed for that day. Uh, that's the reading quiz questions would come from if you have a quiz that day. So there's a question on the reading. Those are intended to be more big picture. Just if you did the reading, hopefully you got a pretty good shot of getting it right. Um, then there's going to be a short answer question. Short answer questions will come from lecture material, lab, um, sort of broad course concepts. There will be one of those quantitative questions on there. And how that works, if we've gone over how to solve some quantitative problem in either lecture or lab, it's then fair game for quizzes from that point on forward. But if you go and you look at that quantitative problem sheet and you look at it and there's a question on there about SDI and using that to calculate relative density, we're not gonna go over that for several weeks now. So as long as we haven't gone over it, it's not fair game for the quizzes, okay? Uh, so until we go over it, it's not gonna be on the quizzes. 
Um, so that's five questions. You've got quantitative short answer reading, two terms. Each of them is worth two points. And so that's out of 10 points. And then there's a sixth question on every quiz that's just a bonus question. You can earn two points on that. So it's possible to earn 12 uh, out of 10 points on each quiz. So there's built-in bonus points already on the quizzes. Um, and there is partial credit. You can get either zero, one, or two points on, on each of those questions. Uh, the quizzes will kind of be random, uh, given throughout the semester. Um, so some weeks you might have a quiz Tuesday and Thursday. Some weeks you won't have a quiz at all. It's just going to depend on uh, how the semester goes. If we end up flipping online, what I'm going to do is I'm going to group together about four quizzes and give those to you a little more like an exam. Um, so instead of having them periodically, you know, averaging about one a week, you'll have about one a month that'll be larger and we'll take more time. on. So any questions on those quizzes or the bonuses? And again, that makes up about half the course grade. Okay. Um, so then the other half of the class is lab. Uh, and what I'm doing this semester, you know, of course, we might get flipped online at any point, right? Um, and lab's going to be hard to do if we get flipped online. So my plan for that today uh, and next week in lab. So lab will meet today at two. We'll meet over in the Sylvan's yard. Uh, we head out in the vans for all the labs except two that are noted on the syllabus. The two we don't go out into the labs in, into the field for, we usually do in a computer lab on campus. But this semester, I'll set those up on Zoom for you. So we'll do those via Zoom. And those are already, I think, highlighted and noted there in the syllabus. Every other lab, we hop in the vans. Uh, we go out to the field. And so what I'm going to do today and next Tuesday, our goal this afternoon is to hit six different stands at the Experimental Forest and over on the what's called the Nakanich Mitigation Area. It's not Lake Nakanich at all. Um, it's right there on seven uh, just between Angelina and Nagadoshes County, so southwest of town. And so four of the stands are within walking distance on the experimental forest, uh, and then two of the stands are at that neck and each mitigation area, so we only have to make a, a few drives, so hopefully that'll be doable in our time. And my plan on each of those stands is you walk into it, take pictures, take whatever notes you want, and just, you know, be on the ground in that stand, look around. I'll give you names for them all. I've got a list for all of them. And so what we'll do, this week is six. Next week, we'll do four of them. I've got a couple on private land up north of town near Lake Nakanich, and then we'll do a couple here in town. It's half pine stands, half hardwood stands. Um, and then if we get flipped online at some point, we'll do prescriptions on those stands in the future. So you already will have been on the ground in them. You'll have notes from them. I'll go out and do 360 videos where you can look around in them and post those up and make those available for you. And then what you really need for prescription, you need to know what the landowner wants, what their financial constraints are, what other constraints on that property might be. So I'll give you all that. We're not gonna do that today or next week. You'll just see sort of the stand structure, the species that are out there, all that sort of stuff. And so that's how I'm gonna adjust lab in case we flip online. So we've got a plan. If we end up being face-to-face -face all semester, we're just gonna go back to those stands later in the semester and that's fine. Um, so it'll work out either way. So uh, that's the plan for lab. Um, if you look here, let's see if I can hit back. Uh, there's the Civil Culture Useful Handouts packet right there. You're not going to need those today. You're not going to need those next week. Uh, but you're going to want to print that out and start bringing that to labs in the future. Uh, because usually what we do in lab and what most of your lab grade is, is we'll go out to the woods, we'll talk about the topic for the day, we'll look around in that stand, we may collect a little bit of data. Um, but then once we've done that, you basically sit down in the field and you write out a field prescription, which is a one page plan for that stand. And let me see if I can find that. Um, and so for those prescriptions, um, each of those is worth up to 10 points. Add all those together by the end of the semester. That's the other half of your grade. That's the lab grade. And so for these prescriptions, if you want practice on them, so here's all the labs that are up already. Some of them even have videos up from last spring, uh, some of those towards the end of the semester. Uh, but what I also have up here for you is uh, the useful handouts packet again, uh, but then you have prescription practice. And so with prescription practice, it walks you through five or six steps uh, where you can look at the different labs you need to learn how to write a prescription. And then it's got a couple stand maps right here on campus so you can all access them. One of them is the bottom lane hardwood stand, Tucker Woods right beside us here. And so you can go out there, it gives you landowner objectives and it gives you two different sets of landowner objectives. So you can write two different prescriptions and then you can write out a prescription uh, for that stand. So you get some practice doing that. 
Um, and then if you look, again, if you scroll way further down on there, I've written out one possible answer uh, key for it for you as well. Uh, so you can see an example there. Uh, the other stand is over on the southeast corner of campus here um, near the trails and gardens. So, so that's what we're doing for lab. So any, any questions on lab this semester? Yeah, Katie. Yeah, we sit down and uh, you write them there on the fly in lab. It's just one page. You can uh, look at the template I've got for you all on here. Um, the other thing is, and it should be uh, there on lab one, uh, on the back of the prescription sheets is a, a, ten, a list of 10 things. And those 10 things are the most common mistakes students make uh, writing prescriptions. And so it gives me shorthand to grade them more quickly uh, with 52 of you. Um, where I can just write a one and circle it or a two and circle it and you flip over to the back of the sheet and it lists out that problem. But it's also there to help you learn how to write good prescriptions where you can flip it over and you can see common mistakes. So hopefully you can avoid them and do better. So. Um, and with those, they're open calculator, open note. Um, it's an individual effort, but you can use that useful handouts packet. You can use the lab handouts. You can use other materials. Yes, Al? Those are going to give us quiz sheets and prescription sheets or do we have to print them out? Um, if, if you're nervous about getting stuff handed out, you're welcome to print them out. Um, if they're not up here, I'll get them posted up here so that you can, you can do that. Um, uh, the, prescrip the prescription sheets are up there. The quiz sheets aren't, but I can do that. But then I'll bring extras as well. And then we'll, we'll see how it works out. I'm going to tinker with an idea here for the um, prescription sheets where what you can do is you'll turn the hard copy into me in the field. But before that, you can snap a photo with your phone and I can set up a Dropbox on Brightspace and you can upload that picture to that Brightspace Dropbox uh, if you want. And that way, if you do that, I can grade them on that and get it back to you digitally. It'll be the same thing just digitally. That way I don't have to pass it back to you. So, so that'll be an option for folks. We'll see how that actually works out. Um, I don't know. We're just kind of winging all this a little bit. So yeah. what other questions you all have on labs? So they've spaced us out in the vans a little bit more. Basically the rule on vans is nobody, nobody in the middle seat. Um, so our vans with the back bench out will carry six and the uh, Ford Transit and the vans with the back bench in will carry eight. Um, so with 52 of us, we're gonna need seven or eight vehicles. Um, so I, I emailed a bunch of drivers. I think four of you are already good to, good to go on driving, uh, but there were a number of you that are close. You just had some minor permit requirement or Christy Sorrells needed to copy your driver's license or something, but. Um, if you can knock that out, if you're one of those folks that needs a little bit more paperwork anyway, you can knock that out by this afternoon. We'll, we'll see. It's going to be tight on drivers, but uh, they have bumped up van driving to 10 bucks an hour. So you get paid a little bit more. So, okay. Any, any questions on lecture or lab? Let's see if I can get rid of this. There we go. Um, and so you already saw in my emails, so, so who likes free stuff? Yes, yeah, so you guys are really lucking out this semester. You saw my emails. This class is listed as three credit hours, so 50 minutes Tuesday, Thursday. But even in that eight o'clock time slot, we know everyone's got free eight to nine fifteen. Uh, so normally you get some free class time there. So uh, the whole workload is set up for a three credit hour class, so it's fair for everyone. Uh, but here we'll often go till 745 or so. So you get some extra time in there and you guys can see based on the students who took this last spring, you guys get an extra course letter and an extra course number. So even more free stuff. So, okay. Um, would I want to do any other questions on any sort of class logistics, anything like that? Okay. There's, there's restrooms out there. If y'all need restrooms, uh, we check they are unlocked. Um, and then these fans, if you guys want them off, we can turn those off. I emailed the safety guy about whether we should have the fans off or on, and he sent a paragraph email that basically said, I don't know. So no one knows from a coronavirus standpoint if they're good or bad. But. Or we can turn them to high and it'll blow the whole notebook off the table. Okay, uh, so what I want to do for the rest of uh, class today here um, is go over an introduction to silviculture for you and then end up with a, a class activity uh, that'll help us start thinking about some of the, the challenges with silviculture. Let's see if I can get the notes view going so I can see the slides. This is quite an angle to look at it from up here. Okay, and so we already talked about all this stuff, but I think we'll be walking a mile, mile and a half this afternoon. The heat index is supposed to be like 101, so bring plenty of water. 
Uh, I know it's a little hotter with a face mask on. But. Okay, um, so let's start talking about what silviculture is. Um, and you guys saw when I looked at the course documents on the website that there were no lectures up. Uh, with my general practice in silviculture, I'll get this posted after lecture. So all these slides you will have access to um, after lecture. If you go on the website and they're not up, it just means I, I haven't gotten around to it yet. I may have forgotten, so just send me an email uh, to remind me and I'll, I'll get them posted for you all. Okay, uh, so when we start talking about silviculture, you all had field silviculture. Uh, so what sort of pieces are we going to need in a definition of silviculture? What do we do in silviculture? Yes, yeah, so we're mixing art and science, and we'll get into that a lot today. What else do we need? So we're doing what to tree grow? Cultivating. Cultivating, okay. So cultivating tree grow. So I'm saying something over here. So it's at the stand scale. Okay, so we're working at the stand scale. What else? What's that, Alana? Yeah, we definitely need landowner objectives. And so here's the, here's the big long formal definition, but you guys have all worked with this a little bit already. So there's our art and science piece. Um, and Katie said cultivating, this says controlling, same idea, we're manipulating uh, properties within a stand. But here are the five things we're, we're manipulating. So we have to know what we're gonna manipulate. And so it's gonna be the establishment, which is new trees on the ground. Growth, so taking the trees we've got, getting them larger. We're going to affect the composition. What does composition refer to? So composition is the species in our stand. We can impact the health of a forest. Um, so can you think of any obvious examples of how silviculture can impact forest health here in the south? Say we think about pine stands. What's a big issue we have with pine stands in the south? Yeah, so we have southern pine beetle, we have bark beetles, right? but we found we're pretty good with silviculture manipulating them, right? They can be a big risk, but if you thin your stand down to appropriately low densities, it mitigates that risk. So we can manipulate the health of a forest in many cases, not all, but in many cases. And then we can try and manipulate quality. And we manipulate quality in a number of different ways. So again, if you think about an example of thinning, if we go in and we remove some trees in a stand to grow the trees that we've left, give them more of the site resources, well, if we remove the trees that are of lower quality for our landowner objective, we've improved the quality of that stand, okay? So those are the five things we're manipulating. And then here's basically the piece of why we do it, okay? So you're in forests and woodlands. We are at the stand scale. That's not explicitly in here, but that is how silviculture works. So we've got forests and woodlands. And why are we doing it? We're meeting diverse needs and values of landowners and society on a sustainable basis, okay? so. Uh, good silviculture is sustainable. It's not just logging an area and moving on, only worried about what goes on the log truck. It's focused on the forest, the next forest, uh, and the process to make this sustainable so we can do it rotation after rotation after rotation. And so I'm going to give you sort of these three different sort of schematics or definitions uh, here that you can see the small graphics of. And I've got the filing cabinets up there. So there's going to be a lot of different stuff we're going to go over this semester uh, that you need to understand how to put together a good civil cultural prescription and how to manage a stand. And so it's a lot, it's complex, there's a lot of details there. So it's hard to keep track of it all at first. So what I'm going to use is these various diagrams all semester to sort of help you organize all this diverse material we're going to get so you can sort of build a filing cabinet in your head and start seeing how all the pieces fit together. Um, so I'm just going to go over each of these briefly. Uh, but here you see a Venn diagram. I basically stole this Venn diagram from sustainability, where the word in the middle was sustainability, not silviculture, uh, which you can find these all over the internet. But because silviculture is sustainable, this works really, really well for silviculture. And this is going to be really critical to understanding how to craft a good prescription. And so we've got three main pieces that we need to be aware of. We need to be aware of the ecology, okay? Um, so say you put together a prescription and later this semester, we're gonna get into using PTEDA to model the growth of pine plantations because uh, they're very simple ecosystems. We can do that pretty easily with relatively simple software, easy to use. 
And so, you know, as we're looking at that, one thing we're going to predict is the mean annual increment. So that's how many tons of wood can we grow per acre per year? Because if you're managing Stanford timber, that's going to be something that's very important to focus on. And so with that, you know, you can tell me, oh, I've got a mean annual increment of 15 tons per acre per year. Okay. In most stands in the South, that's not ecologically feasible. Okay, if you had a fantastic site in just the right location with the best genetics and the best silviculture, maybe you can start getting close to that, but that's pretty unlikely on most sites. So if we go out on a sandy site that has cacti around and yucca and the site index looks like it's 55 feet at 25 years, the trees are getting 55 feet tall at 25 years, 15 tons per acre per year is an absolutely absurd number. It's not going to happen. Okay. So that's, you know, one way to look at ecology where, you know, you have to be within the ecological capacity of the system. The landowner might want 15 tons per acre per year, but if it's not biologically possible, it's never going to happen. Okay. Another thing we're going to focus on a lot with ecology is looking at the silvics of our species. So what's the shade tolerance? What's the flood tolerance? Um, what's the mode of reproduction? Are these wind dispersed seeds? Are these, you know, heavy seeded species? How many seeds do we need per acre if we're relying on natural regeneration? If we get a bunch of seedlings growing in the understory of a stand, what do we have to do to get them bigger? What do we have to do to release them so they can grow into the overstory? What do we have to do if we have a bad Chinese tallow project and Alejandro's out of town so we can't get them to go spray? I mean, these are all the sort of things you got to think about with the ecology there. So often you all are pretty comfortable with the ecological piece. You know, you've all had ecology with Dr. Kidd. Uh, that's one of the reasons you're in forestry. So we're often pretty comfortable with that. Uh, one thing that often takes a little bit more time to start figuring out is this economics piece. And within that economics piece, you could also throw in forest operations. So you can write whatever you want on a sheet of paper, but if you can't get a logger to go out in the woods and do it, it's not a realistic prescription, okay? Um, so getting that economics operational piece figured out is going to be a little more complicated, probably some new material there uh, for many of you. And we'll go over that and get into a lot of detail there. We're not going to do full economic analyses. I'm going to give you simplifying assumptions uh, because many of you haven't had forest economics yet. And then what you'll do is when you get into uh, our forest management plans course, that's where you really bring the prescriptions and the economics together uh, in a much more realistic way. So economics and operations are going to be key to making sure a prescription works. Uh, then we need that societal piece as well, especially when you start talking about federal or state land, uh, where there are a number of either federal or state uh, laws, regulations that need to be followed, uh, processes to managing a forest that can get very complex. So we'll see a lot of that in the Western US, where states can be 50 to 90% federal land. Uh, so that's going to be pretty big. But even around here, there's lots of different societal things you, you need to think about. Are you leasing that land out for hunting? Um, what are the adjoining landowners you've got? Uh, we, we, even on private land, we have regulations that we do need to follow. If you're applying herbicides, herbicides are regulated under federal law by the EPA. It's illegal to apply them in a manner inconsistent with the label. And so those are all things we need to be aware of. So we need each of those pieces to make silviculture work. Okay, so that's one way to think about organizing silviculture. Another way to think about organizing silviculture is the process. So imagine going through a whole rotation. So around here, that's easy to think about because we have a lot of pine plantations. Uh, they're easy to use in teaching and learning silviculture because they're very simple ecosystems. One species, even age silviculture, which is as simple as it can be. And so you go out there, you clear cut the former stand. That's your regeneration treatment, a clear cut, a seed tree, a shelter wood, uh, we talked about these briefly in intro to forestry. You've heard about that a little bit um, in field silviculture, but that's going to be the major focus of the first real unit here in our course, where we'll be going over eight different regeneration treatments. So regeneration treatment is regenerating the next stand by removing all or part of the previous stand. And so that's our big opportunity throughout the process of a rotation to influence the, the properties of that forest. That's where we're doing the most change. So if you want to shift to a different species on a site, if you want to shift to a different forest structure on a site, that's your best opportunity to do it. Often after the regeneration treatments, we need establishment treatments. So that might be mechanical site prep. If you've got a problem with your soils, that's your chance to fix it. Because once trees are in the ground, they have roots and you don't want to disturb the soil much, right? Because it would damage your tree roots. 
potentially kill or damage your trees. Um, that's where you may use prescribed fire or mechanical treatments to remove slash to get all the woody debris out of your way uh, so that you can do what you need to do in that stand. Uh, that's your opportunity to plant trees where you can plant whatever species you want that's going to be successful on that site. You can plant genetically improved trees. So we've got all different types of seedlings you can get uh, to plant. Uh, we've got sites that may need fertilizer. That's your chance to fertilize. And in pretty much all our stands where we're planting trees here in the south, we're applying herbicides. Because uh, without herbicides, you're not going to get the composition that you want out there to make it worthwhile for you to plant trees. So we have lots of different establishment treatments. That being said, sometimes you don't need any establishment treatments. So say you had a bottomland hardwood stand with 30 different species in it, lots of sweet gum, lots of different red oaks. You might be fine to go in and do a shelter wood where you go in, cut down about half the overstory. That's part of your regeneration treatment. A clear cut is a regeneration treatment where in one harvest you sort of do the whole thing. But most of our other regeneration treatments take multiple harvests to implement. So then you wait five or 10 years after you've removed half the overstory in that shelter wood, and then you come back and remove the rest of the overstory. So what you did in that period of time when you had some light, but not a ton of light on the forest floor, you were growing desirable species like red oaks and sweet gum, while that shade was preventing less desirable species, maybe that Chinese tallow or other species from establishing and becoming dominant in that next cohort of trees. Then you remove the rest of that overstory, those older trees that releases your young cohort, your regeneration methods done, you may not need any establishment treatments at all. So you may need a lot of them, you may need very few of them, it depends on what you're trying to do, what problems you're trying to solve. Okay, and then that moves us into this bottom phase, intermediate treatments. Uh, you can also think of this as the tending phase of a rotation. That's where you are for most of the time, okay? So if you're working for a forest products company and they have a half million acres, okay? If you've got that half million acres on a 25 year rotation on average, that means each year you cut 1 25th of your acreage to keep everything completely sustainable. If it was all that neat, it's not always gonna be that neat, but that's sort of the rough idea. Which means you're only cutting 4% of your stands in a given year, you're only regenerating 4% of your stands in a given year, which means 96% of your stands are in this tending phase, okay? And so the vast majority of what we do in silviculture from an acreage standpoint, from a focus standpoint, is gonna be managing existing stands. And so with that, we have a lot of treatments. And some of them are the same as establishment treatments. Prescribed fire could be used in the establishment or in the middle of a rotation, herbicides, fertilizer, and then another major, major one is going to be thinning, whether it's commercial thinning, where you go out, you cut trees down, not all the trees, but some of the trees, you put them on a log truck, you send them to a mill. That's what makes it commercial. Sometimes you need to go in and do pre-commercial thinning. Say you did a seed tree where you just left 10 trees per acre to seed in your next cohort of pines. It could be short leaf pine, any species. And then you remove them three to five years later. That was your regeneration treatment. But let's say you, you really want 1,000 pines per acre. But you go out there and you start looking around and when they're you know an inch or two in diameter they're five years old you've got seven thousand of them per acre okay that's way too dense it's going to take them a long time to go through stem exclusion if you've got a fire or a drought all of them are going to die and so that's a stand where you may do pre-commercial thin and when those trees are only an inch or two in diameter that may be a matter of just sending a crew out there where they have machetes and they just cut them down if it's you know any of our southern pines we have here in east texas they're not going to re-sprout. So you cut them, they're dead, easy, no herbicides needed, um, and you can bring your density down, but they're just chopping them down with a machete, leaving them out there in the field, or a brush saw or whatever piece of equipment works. And so you're not removing any forest products, it's a pre-commercial thing. So a few different options on thinning there along with a bunch of other treatments. So this is sort of the process of silviculture, and this is how the class is structured, where we'll give you sort of an introduction unit, then we have a regen treatment unit, then we have an establishment treatment unit, and then we do the intermediate treatments as a unit. So this is how the whole class is structured. Okay, so with establishment, here's a few examples of some of those different treatments, uh, where that top left photo, you can see that's a cherry bark oak seedling. So that's from natural regeneration. May not need any establishment treatments there if you're relying on natural regeneration. Um, the picture next to it is a, a person there in a tractor drawn machine planter. Um, so that's something you might see on an old field. Um, often our machine planters that you'll see out on a stand that was recently clear cut, it's what we call a wildland planter. So it's a small dozer with a blade on the front 
to move some of the old slash out of the way. And often the person is in an enclosed cab because you don't want to have people getting hit by slash that's uh, kicked up by the dozer. But there you can see that person's putting little longleaf seedlings in the ground. But then this picture up over here, let me see, get the mouse over there, maybe. There we go. This picture up over here in the upper right, there's a bunch of longleaf pine cones on the ground. So you can regenerate longleaf pine naturally too. Um, it's only going to produce seed every three, five, seven years on average, depending on where you are. Uh, so, you know, most years you can't do that. Some years you can't. Um, on the bottom left, you see a picture that's planted live olive pine plantation. And so we have a lot of sites like that in southeast Oklahoma and Arkansas around here with that sort of topography where we plant a, a fair bit of live olive pine. And so there's another example of plantation. Bottom right, it's a hardwood plantation. In this case, it's eucalyptus. And so we had a program through about 2015 or so where a company was planting eucalyptus in southeast Texas and southwestern Louisiana. They ended up establishing about 8,000 acres of it. Uh, but it was very expensive. It was costing $1,500 an acre to get it established, seven or eight herbicide treatments. They decided it wasn't worth doing. Um, so you may still see, see some of those around if you're down near Maryville or Singer, Louisiana. You're driving through the woods and you see some weird tree. You know, there's still some of those eucalyptus stands out there. So, so there's an example of a hardwood plantation. For intermediate treatments, on the, the left here, you see a uh, typical first thin in a pine plantation. So that might be a row thin, where you're cutting down every third, fourth, or fifth row of trees. And you're cutting down that row of trees mostly just to get you access. You've got a big piece of equipment doing the logging. You need access, so you need to cut down a row just so you can drive down it and get to the rest of the trees. Um, in the middle picture there, you see someone pruning trees. And so if you prune trees, you remove the dead and sometimes the live limbs, which means all the wood that grows outside that doesn't have knots. It's not free wood, so it's higher value. Uh, so we don't see a ton of that here in East Texas. We do see a fair bit of that done by Weyerhaeuser up in Southeast Oklahoma and Arkansas. Uh, so there is a local example. Um, and then on the, the right there, they're uh, using a mist sprayer to spray out a product like glyphosate. So that might be an herbicide application. You don't see too many of those mist blowers around here, but they are still used in some places. That'll throw a foliar active herbicide like glyphosate, you know, just 20 feet in the air, blow it out real far. Um, those that had field station online this past summer, you saw one of those videos of David Schnocky giving you an example of those. So, so there's some intermediate treatments for you. And then we get back to regeneration treatments. So we, we group our regeneration treatments into the age class structure they produce. So if you have a clear cut of seed tree or a shelter wood, they grow you one new cohort of trees that are all about the same age. So they're even aged. It may take multiple harvests. With a shelter wood, it can take one, two, three, even more harvests to do that. With a seed tree, it typically takes two harvests. With a clear cut, it only takes one harvest. But over most of the rotation, you only have one cohort of trees going out there at a time. It's even aged. That picture you see on the top right, that's an example of group selection. And so group selection is something that you see practiced around here a lot for wildlife, because what you want is structural diversity. Uh, so if Alana wants to manage a stand for a bunch of birds, um, and you want big trees for some species, you want little trees and dense patches for cover for other species, you want a lot of variability on one property, group selection is great. If you have a landowner that only has 100 acres, but they want to harvest timber every five or 10 years, so they don't have to wait 80 or 90 years till they get a big chunk of income and then have a clear cut property, this may be a really good solution. But the idea is you punch in small gaps, okay? You punch in a bunch of small gaps, you get species that are probably a little more tolerant of shade regenerating in those small gaps. Then you come back in five or 10 years and you do the same thing again on the same stand, just in different spots. So the stand looks messy by the end of this. You have young trees, you have middle-aged trees, you have older trees. And so the forest is very messy, the forest is very patchy, but it gives you compositional and structural diversity if that meets your landowner objective. The primary downside to that is just it's gonna be more complicated to implement. Go out and clear cut, that's simple, that's easy. We see a lot of clear cutting around here. That works well, it's just a little bit more complicated. Then the bottom photo there, that's a cherry bark oak stand where they're implementing a shelter wood. So you can see they've already removed about half the overstory. They're getting good regeneration, a new cohort coming up in the understory there. And then after five to 10 years, they'll go out and they'll remove those overstory trees to get them out of the way to release that younger cohort. That's also really good for heavy seeded species. 
So think about what happens if you leave three big oaks per acre and you're trying to get those acorns to grow into new oak trees. What happens to the acorns if you're only leaving three oaks per acre? They're going to disappear. They're going to get eaten, right? Uh, and they're not going to move over your whole acre. It's a heavy seeded species. So if you've got heavy seeded species like oak subject to hybridation, a shelter wood might be necessary just from the reproduction biology, that aspect of the silvics of the tree. But it also handles the shade tolerance of your seedlings. Many tree species, even our shade intolerant pines, they'll be pretty tolerant of shade until their shoulder head height and then they start losing that shade tolerance. So you have a window there where you can grow them in shade, they'll be okay. And if you get the overstory off in time, the rest of it, then you've released them, you've got a good new cohort of trees, so. Okay, so that's, again, that's the process of silviculture, going through that whole process. Um, the last thing I wanna look at here is the intensity of silviculture, okay? So we've got all these different options for silviculture, and across the landscape, we're deploying all of them just in different places, in different locations, okay? So if you look at the 800,000 acres of national forests and grasslands here in Texas, they're, they're managed, there's some timber harvesting there, but there's not a ton of timber harvesting. They're managed relatively extensively, okay, without a ton of treatments. They're managed on long rotations. They're not fertilizing them. They are using a fair bit of prescribed fire, so they are using some treatments, okay? If you go and look at a national park somewhere, national parks generally, they focus on more of a preservationist ethics. So that may be a strict forest reserve where there's very little management on uh, Now, when you look at national parks and you think they're not doing any management, you'd be surprised how much they really are doing. Uh, so the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, for example, um, they've got about a half million uh, acres there and it looks like they're not doing much, but then you start finding out and talking to the park service po folks they're out there treating invasive species all the time. They're out there using herbicides uh, to kill um, tree of heaven. Uh, it's gonna be a major one. They have silk tree, number of other species. They're out there dealing with insect pests all the time. So they've got hemlock woolly adelgid, which is an aphid that has come in and has basically wiped out 80% of the hemlocks across their, their range in the east. So they're out there. And if you look in populated areas within the park near campgrounds, near heavy day use areas, and you look at the base of the live hemlocks, they've all got these little pink dots on them. Usually where people aren't looking, they're on the backside from the road. Uh, the color on them tells you which year the Park Service came out and injected them with a systemic pesticide uh, to prevent the hemlock woolly adelgid from killing those trees. So they can't save all of them, but they're, they're saving the ones that people are more likely to see that are gonna be more likely if they die to create a hazard to people. So they're doing what they can. So even in areas where it may be a natural forest reserve, they may be doing some level of silviculture, some level of management in order to keep that forest looking like what we think it should look like. So those areas where you're not doing much management, you tend to have longer rotations, high biodiversity, high ecological complexity. Then the other end of the spectrum, we've got a fair bit here in the Southern US with the, the lava log pine plantations that are pretty ubiquitous. And that's almost agriculture with trees. So that's gonna be very intensive management. Um, those who've had field station over the last few years, uh, either on video or face-to-face, -face, Dr. Oswald showed you his silvopasture trial. Okay, so that silvopasture trial is going to be very intensive agroforestry system where you're mixing cows with pasture grasses with trees, you're pruning the trees, you're doing all sorts of management there, fertilizer and everything. Um, plantation forest is right next to that. And so here's the deal, we know time equals money, right? Uh, so when you make an investment, the longer you can keep that investment. So if you put money into your retirement account when you're 25 or 30, that, that's going to be a lot more money when you retire at 65. Uh, so over time, the compounding value of interest adds up. Uh, what that also means is there's an opportunity cost. So if you want to manage a forest and you want to buy an acre of forest land, okay, if you're buying an acre of forest land and it's going to take you 80 years to get a harvest on that, that forest may be worth less to you today than a forest where you buy an acre of forest land and in 25 years you're able to harvest a forest, okay, because of that time value of money. So in areas where we have long growing seasons, species with high growth rates that work well, we may be able to grow trees on a shorter rotation. And when they're on that shorter rotation, we can now afford to invest a lot of money in those stands and we're willing to do it. Uh, if you're managing where your objective is, let's maximize financial return 
it, it's going to make sense to do. You're going to make money in those situations. So this is why in our pine plantations in the South, we have high productivity. You can grow a lot of tons per acre per year. But to do that, you're investing in a lot of silver culture. You're spending a lot of money on fertilizers, herbicides, uh, genetically improved trees, containerized trees that are more expensive, but more likely to survive and do better early on. But you can get high economic returns. So that's where you can sort of throw the silver cultural kitchen sink um, at a prescription because you can afford to use all these different treatments. The downside of that, of course, is lower biodiversity, less ecological complexity. So we, we really need all these different forest types on our landscape uh, so that we can get everything we want out of the forest, not all in one place, but across uh, our whole landscape of forests. So we'll look at that and think about the intensity of silviculture a lot this semester. We have a fair bit of extensive silviculture here in the southern U.S. and here in East Texas. So we have a lot of hardwood areas. So when you look at just our bottom land hardwoods is one example of relatively extensive silviculture around here. It's about 30 million acres in the south. It's about 2 million acres of our forest land in East Texas. We have about 12 million acres of forest land in East Texas. So that's about 17%. So those are areas we're managing pretty extensively. Uh, if all goes well this afternoon, we'll get out on three of those sites that we'll get to look, look at. With, with those hardwood areas, you tend to manage them on 40 to 80 year rotations, where a 40 year rotation, you might be managing for products like pulpwood. 80 year rotation, you might be managing for products like saw timber, larger dimensional products. Um, and so they're going to be pretty valuable when you do harvest them, however. Uh, when you harvest these areas, uh, the timber values you may be seeing maybe twice what you would get clear cutting a pine plantation. Higher value species, uh, and they may get to larger sizes over that rotation. And then you've got a lot of diversity for wildlife hunting, all sorts of uses there that you may not have as much value out of on a plantation. Um, we also have a lot of intensive silviculture in the south. Um, so with our intensive silviculture in the south, again, we've been talking about these plantations. I've got a lecture here next week where we'll go over why we talk about plantations so much. There's reasons for that. But again, we throw the kitchen sink at them. We throw all sorts of treatments at them, but it works. Let's look at why it works. So if you look at this graph here, we've got about 34 million acres of plantations in the Southern US that's projected to increase to about 50 million acres. Um, and with that, what you can see on this bar graph, we've dramatically increased productivity. So if you look at your y-axis there, it's labeled in terms of cubic foot of wood per acre. Um, most of us like to think in terms more of tons per acre nowadays, because when you see a log truck rolling down the road, if it's fully loaded in East Texas, that'll carry about 28 and a half tons of wood. Okay, so a log truck's about 28 and a half tons of wood. Well, there's an easy conversion here. If you have 100 cubic feet of wood, that's three tons, give or take. Okay. So if we look at this, that thousand cubic feet of wood, it's now 10 hundreds and each hundreds equal to three. So that thousand cubic feet of wood is about 30 tons. So when we look at it this way, thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand, five thousand, that's one truckload of wood per acre, two truckloads of wood per acre, three truckloads of wood per acre. So that's a very easy way to start thinking about um, forestry because you know, if you have one load of wood per acre, you're gonna have a hard time getting loggers to bid on that job. If you have four loads of wood per acre, you're going to have a very easy time getting loggers to bid on that job, right? It's going to make more sense for them. But that, that's how we can think about this y-axis so it's not as abstract as cubic feet per acre. But look at a pine plantation in the south in 1940. It would have been naturally regenerated. You wouldn't have even been planting any trees. That would have been a 50-year rotation. And at the end of 50 years, you would have harvested one truckload of wood per acre, OK? Then look at what starts happening in the 1950s. We add in that reddish bar, that's planting trees, that increases productivity. In the 1960s, we add in mechanical site prep, fixing problems with the soil. We add in tree breeding. We start breeding our lavalli pines in the south in the mid 1950s. That starts giving us a little bit of gain in growth, okay? Then you move on over to the 70s. We had that purple bar, which is competition control. That's herbicides. We start using herbicides in forestry in the south in the 70s on a broad scale. Um, and you start adding in fertilizer as well. So we've got all our tr treatments that we're going to be deploying in the south. We've got them all by the 1970s. So these treatments have been around for 50 years. But you can see what's happened over the decades to the right of the 70s there. We're getting more and more growth out of them because we're learning how to use them better. We're learning how to combine them better. We're combining them with good soil maps. We're combining them with GIS. We're combining them with just a better understanding of how they all work together. 
with some of these treatments like tree breeding, the longer you do it, the better it gets, right? So we've been doing it for longer, but look at where we end up. And this graph ends in 2000, 20 years ago. Uh, so it's even better to the right, but now we're up to 6,000 cubic feet per acre. So that's not everywhere, but that's on your best stands with your best silviculture. You're now pulling off six truckloads per acre of wood, not one. And what's not shown on there is we've cut the rotation length in half. So we went from a 50 year average rotation to about a 25 year average rotation. So over the last 70 years with what we've been doing silviculturally in the South with intensive silviculture, we've cut our rotations in half uh, and we've multiplied our productivity by a factor of five or six. So basically our stands are 10 times as productive today as they were when Dr. Paul Havey started his career. So much more growth out of them. So intensive silviculture works. And so there you can see there's those same three diagrams. So that's a little bit more context on them. And again, we're gonna be going over a lot of complex stuff this semester. Hopefully this helps you sort of tie all that together uh, to build our understanding of silviculture, okay? So let me see here what I wanna do uh, for the remaining here. We've got, looks like about 30 more minutes. Um, so what I wanna do is start talking about silvicultural systems um, and get you all going on some sort of hypothetical uh, prescriptions so we can see uh, how you might start thinking about putting all these pieces together. And so that circle I showed you, so let me flip back a slide, that circle there that contains the regeneration treatments, the intermediate treatments, the establishment treatments, everything in that circle is our silvicultural system. So a silvicultural system is everything you do over a course of an entire rotation in a forest silviculturally. It gets a little complicated because we name it after the regeneration method. So if I tell you, oh, that, that stand, uh, that's a clear cut stand. I could be talking about the regeneration method where we're just cutting down almost all the trees to grow that next cohort up and that's all I'm talking about. Or I could be talking about the clear cut silvicultural system where I'm talking about the clear cut. Then I'm talking about the mechanical site prep. I'm talking about the chemical site prep. I'm talking about the prescribed fire. I'm talking about the planting trees. I'm talking about the thinning regimes. All of that combined is that clear cut silvicultural system. So you just need to be a little clear when someone's talking about a clear cut or a seed tree or whatever. Are they talking about just that regeneration treatment? Or are they talking about everything they're doing in the whole rotation, which would be the silvicultural system. And then we class those as even aged, two aged or uneven aged. Um, and so you can start seeing, you know, how many cohorts of trees are you gonna have out on your stand. And so let's, let's talk a little bit about why we're, we're learning these. We're gonna learn eight different silvicultural systems, okay? So why are we learning just these silvicultural systems? So they're the most common, definitely. So why else are we focusing on these eight silvicultural systems? Yeah, it, it fits with what landowners want to have and with what we can actually give them ecologically, right? Uh, if, if they have an unrealistic goal, there's not much we can do about it, right? But yeah, so, so, think, so right now, if you went out and you actually, you know, met with a landowner that had, you know, 5,000 acres and they said, this is what I want on my forest, how confident would you feel right now that you could write something up and get that for them? Very confident, not so confident. Yeah, yeah, you'd be a little nervous, right? Well, that, that's one reason we're learning these. People have been doing these. We have a lot of information on these. So you could come up with something radically different, creative and new that carries a risk with it because, because it's new, will it work? We hope so, we have the rationale, but we don't know, we haven't tested it. These are more tested. And so you can be more confident in prescribing this for a landowner because we know from similar experiences in the past in the literature, uh, talking to a lot of professional foresters that, yeah, this seems to work in this region to meet these landowner objectives with this mix of species. And these are the problems we find sometimes. These are the things that seem to work well with it. it it's tried and true. We, we know how it works. So, um, so there's a few reasons we're learning them, but a lot of it breaks down to forestry being a long-term endeavor. So if you go up into the Northern United States, Canada, you may be in some areas on a hundred year rotation, 120 year rotation. If you screw up your silviculture, maybe your grandkids will find out, okay? But around here, if you screw up your silviculture, you know, you may go through a whole rotation and a half just in your career because we have shorter rotations. Um, so forestry is a long-term endeavor. What you really don't want to do is you don't want to screw something up that gets the landowner less out of that land over the coming decades 
uh, that creates problems for the next forester that's going to follow you to write prescriptions on that stand. You want to, again, manage forests sustainably. And part of that sustainability means we're leaving the next landowner, the next forester with the same opportunities or more than we had. So that means not screwing up our silviculture. So you can try any combination treatments. You can get really creative, and I'm not trying to dissuade creativity, but you just need to be aware of the risks when you're doing it. Might not work. Um, and so we try to minimize risk by adapting things that are pretty well tested. And so again, that whole circle is our silvicultural system, but it is named after just that regen treatment. So here are eight silvicultural systems, okay? And what I've done on this table, and this table is in the useful handouts packet as well, um, each row shows you the age class structure. So that top row is our three even age systems, clear cut, seed tree, shelter wood. The bottom row is our three uneven age systems, patch selection, group selection, single tree selection. The middle two in the blue boxes, uh, those are two H systems uh, where it's deferment and reserves, okay? And so I think we all probably have a pretty good understanding already of the even age systems, the uneven age systems we'll get into more, they're a little more complex. The only difference with the uneven age systems, look at the, look at the position in each column. On the far left, it favors shade intolerant species. You're putting a lot of light on the ground. On the far right, it favors shade tolerant species. You're leaving more shade on the ground. And so you can see the real difference between patch group and single tree selection is how big is that opening you're making in the canopy. If it's a bigger opening, patch selection, smaller opening, group selection, really, really small opening, you may only be removing one tree sized openings, that's single tree selection, okay? So that's uneven age silviculture. They're all the same process, they just differ by how big a hole you're punching in the canopy. And then those 2-H systems, see those little dashed lines sticking out to the sides of those boxes on the 2-H systems? How these 2-H systems work is they modify an even age system. So you can, you, you don't just have a with reserve system, what you have is a clear cut with reserves, a seed tree with reserves or shelter with reserves. So what reserves is, I may do a clear cut, but if I've got a hundred acre stand, there's 20 acres of it I leave and I just don't harvest it. Those are my reserves. Uh, they're serving as habitat for herbs, small mammals, whatever you want. Maybe that's why you're leaving them. And so that's a clear cut with reserves. So you could do that with a clear cut of seed tree or shelter wood. The other option for a two age system is that deferment system that modifies the seed tree or the shelter wood. So in a seed tree, you go out and cut all but maybe five trees per acre to produce seed for your next cohort. In a shelter wood, you take out half the overstory about um, and you let it grow the new cohort and then you remove the rest of the overstory. But what if you don't go do those second harvests? What if you leave those five trees per acre? What if you leave all or some of that over wood uh, in a shelter wood? Well, that now becomes a seed tree with deferment or a shelter wood with deferment. Deferment just means you're waiting. So you're waiting longer than the normal five to 10 years. And so that's how it becomes a 2-H system where you end up with two different cohorts of trees out there. So those are our eight uh, even age systems. There's not even age, sorry. Those are eight silvicultural systems. Only three of them are even aged. Um, so what I wanna do now is a little group exercise uh, to help you all sort of figure this out. Um, so what we'll do normally in silviculture, I've set it up where we get in groups of four or five. It doesn't look like that's gonna be a good idea this semester. Uh, so just pick someone near you without having to move around to work with as a partner, hopefully. Hopefully the spacing will work out on that. Um, and then again, we're all trying to talk through masks too. Uh, so do your best to talk with your partner, but as quietly as possible. That way, if we all stay a little bit quiet, everyone will be able to hear each other. Uh, if we all start yelling, then no one will be able to hear anything. Um, we've got all this outdoor space here too. So if you wanna just you know, head outside and talk outside six feet apart, uh, you can do that as well. Uh, but once you have a partner, what I'm gonna let you do is I'll go over these three little brief cases and then I'll flip back and forth through the slides again so you can see them again. Um, and they're just simple ideas. Here's your landowner objective. Here's your hypothetical area of the country and composition of a forest. You can make up all the details. This is really sort of a thought exercise. One of them is focused on timber, one on wildlife, one on watershed management. You can pick whichever one you want. Uh, but what I want you to do, so uh, go ahead and take a, a blank page. And what I want you to do is make that whole page a tic-tac-toe grid. So make it a, a three by three grid. Okay. Um, and then what you're going to do, the top row is your regeneration treatments. So that's going to be one of those eight we just went over, clear cut, seed tree, all that. So your top row is for regeneration treatments. 
your middle rows for establishment treatments, and your bottom rows for intermediate treatments. So it's just those different phases of a rotation, okay? So top is regeneration, middle is establishment, bottom is intermediate. Now your three columns, uh, it doesn't matter what order you put them in, but one of those columns is for ecological aspects of silviculture, the other is for economic, operational, and the third is for societal, okay? So what we're doing here is we're making a table where we're combining which phase of the rotation, what treatments we're using, and different things we need to think about for that treatment to be successful. So what you're gonna do with your case study here, once I go over the case studies, you're gonna pick one silvicultural system that you think will meet the landowner objectives in that situation, and you're gonna try and put together a hypothetical sort of prescription for a whole rotation. So what regeneration treatment are you gonna use? Once you know your silvicultural system, you know your regeneration treatment, right? And so what I want you to think about, it's going to be a clear cut. Well, what do I need to think about from a societal standpoint? Are there going to be issues there? Okay. What do I need to think about from an ecological standpoint to make sure my clear cut works correctly? And then what are any economic or operational factors I need to consider? And those are the things you're writing down in those nine boxes. Okay. So you can jot down what your treatment's going to be and then the different things you need to think about. So the process you're going to go through, you're going to have your situation. The first step in silviculture is always, what does my forest need to look like? What am I trying to get it to? What does my stand structure need to look like to meet my objectives? What species do I need out there to meet my objectives? That's what you need to think about. Once you have that, figure out your silvicultural system, which defines your regeneration treatment, and then build everything else from there, okay? So any questions on what we're gonna be doing? Okay, you normally I have a handout for this, but again, trying to minimize handouts. Okay, so here are the three brief cases. So in one, you could pick either, you know, a typical level of pine plantation, or you could pick, pick a bottom land hardwood stand. So say you've got something with, you know, chair bark oak, not all of those sort of species in it. But you're here in East Texas, you're working for a large timberland investment management organization. And so this company wants to maximize timber production. They're trying to get financial returns for their investors. So they're trying to grow trees, to harvest trees, to send them to the mill to make money. So that's this landowner's objective. So that's the timber management mini case. And again, not many details. It could be a million acres. It's whatever acreage you want, you know, not, not a lot of detail there. Okay, here's the wildlife management mini case. So say you're managing for bobwhite quail habitat, you're in Georgia, and your landowner is a non-industrial private forest landowner. So this is just a private forest landowner. They like quail, they'd like to hunt quail, and they've got a thousand acres, 2,000 acres, whatever you wanna make, okay? Uh, and you're working with longleaf pine there. So you got a longleaf pine cover type. So I think these first two you guys already probably have a fair bit of familiarity with. Here's something a little bit further afield uh, for you. Um, and so this is a watershed management mini case. And so, let's see if I can get the mouse over there maybe. Oh, well. um, so New York City's at the southeast corner there of uh, New York State. So you've got part of it on Long Island there. Um, and, you know, 14 million people, however many people there. They, they started looking into building a water treatment plant. And what they figured out is they, they just built a water treatment plant from scratch. It would cost them like $10 billion a year to run the thing. Just crazy expensive. So what they figured out is instead they could buy forest land in the Catskill Mountains. So that top green area is the Adirondacks. That's the largest park in the country, 6 million acres, half public, half private land. But that green area that's further south from that, that's the Catskill Mountains. They figured out they could buy forest land in the Catskills and then build a, a giant pipe and aqueduct and get water coming off of these forests in the Catskills. And it would need a lot less treatment because the forest would be doing a lot of the treatment for them and their plant would only cost them like a billion dollars a year. So they could save a ton of money. Um, so if you've watched uh, Die Hard 3, that aqueduct is the big pipe John McCain's driving the dump truck down. Um, so probably a little bit of a dated reference, but uh, so your goal here is you have a bunch of money. Okay, you've got this big mu municipality, all these people paying for water, you've got a big budget, but your goal is to manage forest land in, that, in the Catskill Mountains there for water quality. So you're managing the forest for water. That is your objective because uh, it saves the, the city and all those taxpayers a bunch of money. And so you're working for the municipality and this, the composition you have is hemlock northern hardwoods. So that's eastern hemlock, that's yellow birch, that's sugar maple. And so those are generally very shade tolerant species. Okay. So watershed, wildlife, and timber.
Okay, so who, who picked one of the timber cases? So we got one group here. So what civil cultural system do you all go with? Clear cut, so that's probably everyone's go-to on timber. Makes sense. Um, and then uh, what sort of factors did you find yourself thinking more about what was more challenging? So that's a societal factor. Yeah, definitely. Aesthetics can be an issue. And we'll go over some stuff this semester that'll so e economic factor, the cost, yeah. Yeah, good. And then, uh, so who did the quail? So we had a group here. So uh, so with you all, you were talking about RCWs as well, right? So we're thinking we're gonna get some out just for our rotation. So you guys are getting very detailed already, good. Um, so, so with that, just keep in mind, plot and stand. So make sure, I think you're really talking about stands, not plots, right? Yeah, so keep that straight. But you guys are kind of blending the societal and the economic, right? We're using federal cost share programs. Well, you got people that in Georgia, you're rich anyway. Yeah, well, that's true. But <laughs> I mean, it could be better. It could be 2,000 acres in Texas. But um, <laughs> but yeah, you're, you're blending the sort of societal factor with the economic factor there. So that's good. Um, but with that, with the RCW money, you just have to make sure whenever you add in a second objective, it's going to, it may be harder to maximize one or the other. You may have to do more optimization, right? So you just have to make sure that what you're getting from adding that in is worth, you're gonna have some areas with probably less than ideal habitat, just because they may require slightly different things, right? So that's something you gotta think about. Anybody do the watershed case? Had one group here. So what sort of silvicultural cultural systems were you all thinking? Uh, we thought we were gonna do tax collection, but really the hands off approach and those So go long rotation, extensive silviculture. Yeah, and those selection systems make a lot of sense because if, if you want good water quality, what part of the tree are you really interested in? Roots, right? And those selection systems all leave you roots on your stand pretty much at all times. So those species are so shade tolerant, you can even go a single tree selection, which would give you even more of a lighter impact there. But uh, so how easy was this? You guys had the right answer immediately, got it good, it'll definitely work. Or more discussion, debate, uncertainty. Yeah, so that, that's kind of gonna be a theme this semester. Um, so, you know, you're thinking about what structures you want, you're thinking about the objectives, you're thinking about how those different um, factors are interacting with one another. But really what we're going to see this semester in silviculture is it's complicated. You may come up with a prescription you think works pretty well, and then you can move 10 miles down the road or 100 miles down the road, and it's the same stand on the same soil, same age, same species, ecologically, very, very similarly, but you may have access to different mills. Okay, you move 100 miles away, wood's heavy, hauling wood 100 miles may not be feasible in some situations. And so your woodshed may be totally different, so you have to come up with a completely different prescription. And so everything we're doing in here is going to be conditional. It's conditioned on region, location within a region, landowner objectives, access to mills, weather this year, you know, all those sort of different factors. And so what you got to keep in mind, what you're really doing with silviculture, what you're seeing here is you're, you're thinking about a lot of complex factors, okay? And what you're trying to do, you're operating in the real world, you're trying to come up with some solution. You have a problem, you, you have a goal, you have where you wanna be at the end, you have the state that you're in now, you can go out and timber cruise, measure the forest now, and you're trying to move from one to another. So it, it's problem solving, real world problem solving, but it's complicated. And this is, I, I think, what'll trip folks up more in here uh, compared to classes you've had in the past. It's not like, you know, biometrics or biology class where you take a multiple choice test and here's the one right answer to that question. This is going to be more complicated. So for any prescription where we go and we sit down in the field and here's the woods, here's the objective, there's going to be a lot of right answers. Uh, you guys, you know, may turn in different prescriptions. Someone did a seed tree, someone did a shelter wood, someone did a clear cut. They all get 10 out of 10. They all work the way they did it. They meet the landowner objectives. So there's going to be a lot of right answers. There's going to be a lot of wrong answers too, but it's not a matter of, I have the answer. It's here is an answer that will help solve this complex problem. And that can be frustrating for folks at first. So it's complex. I'm throwing a lot at you uh, pretty quickly here, but just keep that in mind. Uh, it's a process you go through. So just keep working at it, keep focusing on the terms. And we're learning the terms because those are your tools. You got to learn how to use all these tools uh, in order to solve these real world. That's what I've got this morning. We've got lab at two today. So thanks to you all for coming in early.